So the Dark Tide beta launched earlier this month, and it was fantastic. If you don't really know what Dark Tide is yet, it's a first-person shooter with a focus on survival against hordes of enemies, set in the fictional universe of Warhammer 40k. Dark Tide is being developed by Fast Shark, the same developers who gave us the acclaimed Vermintide series, as well as some other interesting titles. Fast Shark's portfolio is scattered with puzzle games, top-down shooters, MOBAs, and platformers. There is, however, one title that really sticks out among the rest. Published by Paradox in 2012 was War of the Roses an online multiplayer, third-person medieval combat game that was heavily inspired by Mountain Blade. It had a high degree of customization and, at the time, a very underused style of play, one found in mostly melee combat. It was a fresh and unique project that ultimately had to compete with chivalry, and it failed. Hard. In 2014, all methods of purchase were taken down, all developer support had ended, and a sequel was released. War of the Vikings. It didn't do any better. In 2017, both games' online services were shut down. Forever lost to time. So how is it that we get from a studio which produced two failed entries into the melee genre to becoming one of the Warhammer franchise's most reputable developers? The best answer to this question is passion. We talked about that. It would be fun to do a Warhammer game, and we didn't. We hadn't. Didn't have. We didn't have the funds. We didn't have the team. We didn't have the know-how. We didn't have the experience. Later, we 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 really could do it, and we were like. In the early days, we were just consultants uh, uh, going around helping projects that went. We started to learn how to build full projects, and th then we started to learn how to self-publish smaller scale games. Uh, uh, so suddenly, everything was aligned. We got the IP, we got the funds, we got the, uh, the, the team, and we got the experience because we've done a lot of games now. We had one focus. We have been doing a lot of games in the past, at this, but we said, like, okay, we need to at the second part of Vermintide, we need to focus only on Vermintide. The developers at Fat Shark love Warhammer. They also love making melee combat games, which by this point they had gotten a lot of practice with. The combination of these two passions resulted in Vermintide. Released in 2015, it was a hit in terms of melee combat mechanics, Warhammer accuracy, as well as public response and sales. So, why does Fat Shark's passion for Warhammer matter? What is Warhammer? We're all pretty big fans of Warhammer here at U Street. We collect the plastic crack. We play the games, for better or for worse. We read the Black Library and listen to the podcasts. And I can tell you firsthand, Warhammer is a jumbled pile of a dorky mess. And that's why we love it. We grew up enthralled by the lore of the expanded universe of Star Wars and the Halo series, zombie media as a whole. Persistent, in-depth universes are our bread and butter. For those of you who either don't know anything about Warhammer or are just getting into the hobby, the Warhammer IP was published by Games Workshop in 1983 and was introduced as a fantasy tabletop war game. With the help of Citadel Miniatures Metalcast models, Warhammer quickly rose above the tabletop scenes in the 80s. Soon after their success, they launched Warhammer 40,000, the grim dark fantasy future in miniature form as well as their Black Library, a division of Games Workshop solely dedicated to building their IPs through literature. With the help of the Black Library, Warhammer 40k quickly became popular due to its total absurdity, with a perfectly descriptive motto. In the grim darkness of the 41st millennium, there is only war. Nearly 40 years later, over 200 Black Library titles, 43 video games, and tens of thousands of cast models later, the Warhammer IP has become a paragon of hobbyists across the world. GW has created a platform so large and so diverse that almost anyone can find enjoyment out of their products. That is not to say that Games Workshop history is without controversy. The Black Library lists 47 separate authors, all adding to the canon of Warhammer, not including the codexes and rulebooks. This has led to an incredibly convoluted universe littered with retcons and inconsistencies. To achieve a full understanding of Warhammer can only really be described as painful. 
Games Workshop has a terrible history of overprotection of their IPs, similar to Disney. Refusal to let people print their own models or bits for tournaments. A complete block of fan-made creations on YouTube and price hikes that would make your wallet quiver. They have a history of terribly made half-assed games to make a quick buck. Mobile games. Uninspired top-down strategy games. Clones of AAA games. More uninspired top-down strategy games. And one particular title. Space Hulk Deathwing. What the heck is Space Hulk? Before I speak on the Darktide beta, I'm going to use another Warhammer title to compare it to. And that game's name is Ver- Now, I'm going to use Space Hulk Deathwing as a direct comparison to Darktide rather than Vermintide. Not only was Vermintide a successful product of the same creative minds working on Darktide, Darktide is being developed with an upgraded version of the Vermintide 2 engine. It's almost a redundancy. I'd much rather take the time to show you how a 40k horde style FPS can fail. I'm going to break up my thoughts on Space Hulk into three parts the story, the gameplay, and the reception. The story of Space Hulk and why it is so neat! You are a librarian of the Dark Angel's first company. Dawn in Terminator armor. You and two other marines must make your way through a derelict ship known as a Space Hulk. A Space Hulk infested with a tyrannid mess. You are the only ones who can put a stop to the infestation before it gets out of hand. Sound familiar? A small group of people running headfirst into a horde of monsters with the intent to overcome the impossible. So far so good, right? To be brutally honest, there's very little exposition or storytelling in the game that doesn't come from unintelligible mission briefings or data slates that I like to refer to as walls of text that completely interrupt the flow of gameplay. The lore is there. The detail and the knowledge of the source material exist in the game, but it is rarely given to us in any meaningful format. There are a very few instances where you psychically dream of some interesting scenarios, which actually end up being super neat. But everything else in the story was pretty forgettable. Let's be honest though, not every game needs a fantastic story. A strong premise and immersive gameplay can really make a game. This game has that strong premise. What kind of person wouldn't want to be a walking tank? eviscerating every bug-like alien in their path, with one of the greatest arsenals known to man 38,000 years in the future. That's fucking awesome. Why is the gameplay of Space Hulk so goddamn boring? Space Hulk is nothing short of beautiful. The atmosphere and sound design are absolutely stellar. Towering pillars all around, garnished with beautiful banners. Ornate doors and banisters that scream dedication to the source material. A level of detail unmatched by most 40k visual media. You can tell that so much love was poured into the visual designs. The weapon's sound media and the clunk of your armor really sells the weight of your character. It's really as if they brought the tabletop version to life. So why doesn't it work? The gameplay of Space Hulk is a loaded topic, with one word echoing down the dark corridors. Repetitive. Your first couple hours will feel like James Workshop himself gifted us a truly immersive and eerie experience. One in which you finally feel like a space marine of the grim dark future. Then, in the next couple hours, you look around and can't help but ask yourself, I've been here already. A little later, you catch yourself thinking, God, I can't take any more heavy footstep sounds or tyranny screams. You'll come to find that the majority of the game is spent wading your way through tight hallways, with a few gene stealers crawling out of some fence to stop you in your tracks for a few seconds every now and then. You'll take 20 steps and boom, another couple gene stealers and maybe a hybrid or two. The game encourages you to take the time to explore and find relics around the map before pursuing the primary objective, but it becomes increasingly difficult and time consuming to wander the map like this. You see, your apothecary, or medic of the team, has a limited amount of healing charges, and to rearm, you must teleport back to your staging area. You can only do this three times per mission. So the longer you spend in a mission, the more you stumble into an ambush, the more challenging it's going to be to complete the final stages. I personally am cursed with a little rat man brain. I want to collect everything, 
I want to see everything a game has to offer. I'm the kind of person who put 150 hours into my first run of Elden Ring just because there was always something new to explore. So when a game teases these collectibles and unique areas, you bet your ass I'm going to crawl my way there. I can understand that this is a unique problem to myself, but it brings to light the real issue. If a game provides content with the expectation that players will want to experience it, then the game not only needs to provide some stimuli in the slower portions, but the game needs to be playable after spending resources on exploration. On top of the issues with the overarching gameplay loop, the gameplay itself leaves something to be desired. As neat as it is to be a 1500 pound machine of death, it can get old pretty fast as you collide with terribly path friendly AI or some railing on the stairs. Moments like these can even end in a rapid team wipe if you're in a tight enclosure. The gunplay itself can be fairly frustrating as well if you're dealing with enemies at a medium or a long range. The most accurate and consistent weapon is the first gun you're given. A standard Mark I Storm Bolter. Every other gun can't shoot past 10 feet or is so wildly inaccurate, you'll never hit your targets. Even the Mark I spray pattern can be frustrating at times if you're pinned down by snipers. The worst part is, snipers are so frequent that the Mark I is a must have for your team and you sure as shit can't trust the AI to use it in any meaningful capacity. You do have the control to change up your weapons, or in multiplayer, you can change your class as a whole, spice up the gameplay for yourself. You want to punch everything so hard it explodes? Or do you want to be the anchor of your team as the medic and ensure everyone keeps waddling onwards? You could even play a magical space wizard who casts lightning out of their forehead. You can do all of this, but the real question is, will it work? Can you beat a level if everybody plays what they want to? You are immediately crippled if you don't have a medic. You now only have a few select chances to heal your entire team per mission. If you don't have a teammate with a bolter, you're gonna be shredded by enemy hybrids with missile launchers or rogue turrets. Somebody should really have a melee weapon for when gene stealers swarm up on you. The game encourages different play styles, but the gameplay locks you into the ones that are basically required. Additionally, these choices are only really available for multiplayer. Let's talk about the multiplayer for a minute. Not every game needs multiplayer. Hell, some games even suffer from their multiplayers. Space Hulk Deathwing sits somewhere in limbo. Did it need multiplayer? Kind of. For a launch price of $40 and a how long to beat score of 11 and a half hours at leisure, it makes sense why multiplayer was a must have by the publishers. Did the multiplayer make it worse? Well, you don't have to play the multiplayer, so it can't exactly make the game worse, but I can't really say it makes it better. Think of how many resources were spent on their online functionality that could have been spent on the main game. How much money and how many man hours were spent. Now, I will say I did have fun in multiplayer, with my friends. Friends who can find fun in just about any game we play together. We here at U Street have a knack for finding enjoyment in some of the most unlikely places. Hours sunk into Farming Simulator, an unabashed love for Cry of Fear, bugging and debugging Resident Evil 6 to completion multiple times. Just because we can find our own fun in a video game doesn't mean that game is good by any standards. Even if you matchmake with voice chat off, you're just going to replay the same missions from the story without any of the exposition, as light as that is in this game. Space Hulk isn't a sandbox. It's not diverse you have one real objective. Get from point A to point B. And the most tragic part is, if you play the multiplayer, you end up throwing the real beauty of this game to the wayside. The quiet. The loneliness. How do people react to the gameplay and video game of Space Hulk, a game that exists? With a Metacritic user score of 56, and mixed reviews on Steam, it didn't quite splash like the developers had hoped. Brett Todd, a writer for GameSpot, used his review to say this, For every impressive set piece and wow moment in combat, there are a dozen befuddling rules or mechanics that make you scratch your head in disbelief. 
AI Space Marines are prone to shuffling in place, turning their backs on attacking enemies right in their faces, and standing in the middle of doorways when you're trying to seal off a room full of aliens. They don't do anything on their own either. You have to tell your Apothecary Marine to patch himself up when his health is low. Otherwise, he just lets himself die. And I just can't help but agree with him. Most reputable reviews you find online are going to say the same thing. Even the Steam reviews are littered with similar opinions. The only saving grace you're really going to find is the atmosphere. I wish I could take myself back and play through the game again for the first time. Because when I launch it now, I find myself tired of it within the first 15 minutes. You might be asking why the hell any of this matters to the Darktide beta. I mean, the game hasn't launched. We don't have the full picture yet. I think that Space Hulk gives us a look at exactly what we should be excited or maybe worried for. Let's recap some of the pros and cons of Space Hulk really fast because I'm going to come back to them when we discuss the beta. You know what Dark Tide is. An intro into Dark Tide, what it is, where it came from, and how it became what it is. You know, the beta though. Horde style survival games hit the ground running in 2008. Gears of War 2 was released with its marketed Horde mode, Valve gave us Left 4 Dead, and Treyarch blew the world away with Call of Duty World at War Zombies. Since these games' obvious success, the gaming industry has been flooded with survival games and horde modes over the last decade. Halo Firefight, Killing Floor, Titanfall 2, Insurgency, Back for Blood, World War Z, Vermintide, Space Hulk. After 15 years of this, the genre just began to blend together. So why is Dark Tide so refreshing? This is the part where we give you the good good on what the story and plot of Dark Tide is and how it affects the setting! A crawling sickness brews in the hive city of Dushim. Chaos and its heretical followers skulk around the underbelly of the city. The Imperial Inquisition must stop these abominations at any cost, and your life is its currency. You are a reject, an undesirable, a waste of the Emperor's precious gift of life. And the only way to free yourself of your servitude is to serve. Now shoot, slash, claw, and crawl your way through the dreads of Tushum, and prove yourself to the God Emperor of Mankind. Your salvation awaits. Solid plot? I'm gonna have to say yes on that one. We've already discussed Warhammer as an IP, as well as its incredible scale as a fictional universe. There is so much source material to pull from, with the added bonus that Dan Abnett, one of the most revered Black Library authors, is literally writing Dark Tide's story. And we've already seen what Fat Shark can do with Warhammer. This is a project for fans, written and developed by fans. And you can see it. In the 41st millennium, Hive Cities can reasonably be expected to house upwards of 2 trillion inhabitants. 2 trillion. And I feel like Tertium has the promise of giving us a taste of this scale. Fun fact for you Nurgle fans out there, Tertium, or Clostridium tertium, is a bacteria that colonizes human and animal intestinal tracts. And I've had to do this take a thousand times because Tertium and Tertium are the same fucking word, but Games Workshop fucking hates me! If I'm just one person, how am I really supposed to make a difference in this setting? Well, that's kind of the point. When you create your reject, you go through a series of choices that determine who you were and what you did to get yourself a post on the Morningstar. These choices will come together and form a narrative backstory, as well as a fully voiced personality of your character. And these characters love to interact with both each other and the world around them. These conversations are where the plot really lives. So the arch heretic hides in a prison. I'm good for now, but we're going to spend a lot of life. Life. I think Bastion's heart is a crack in this prison. It's all a matter of perspective. You say get him, we get him. Still don't lie, Jake. Really? <laughs> it's in the small conversations where you'll learn that your objective in a mission is simply to grab some ammo from an infested depot or to rid a forge of corrupted goo monsters in order to get armored vehicle production pack online for the bigger fights elsewhere in the galaxy. You're not here to save the world. You're here to make sure primordial cogs keep turning. 
You'll obviously have your mission, weapon, character descriptions, but we've already talked about how laying plot out in a written media can really slow things down if not done correctly. Everywhere you look, there is an incredible amount of detail. Everything has a purpose past its looks. The skulls on the doors, the symbols scattered around the world, the chaos effigies, every little detail exists and lines up with the established lore that fans have come to expect in a Warhammer title. But the game doesn't expect anything from you. You don't have to know what these things are, where they've been mentioned, or what they mean. If you have no idea what Warhammer is, or haven't quite made the plunge into this wacky hobby, that's okay. You don't have to. Darktide is clear about what it is. If you like zombie survival games like Left 4 Dead, you will like this game. The immersion and atmosphere exists for you just as much as it does for lifelong fans of 40k. This is a different part of the video where we tell you about the gameplay, including things like shooting, melee, toughness, classes, and fun stuff, LMAO. Darktide is a Horde-style, class-based, team-oriented shooter-slash-slasher, objective-aligned survival game, and none of that is particularly new. But it doesn't have to be new. It has to be consistent. It needs to improve on these overused gaming traits, and it needs to flow. Fast Shark knows this. You have a direct choice of playstyle as soon as you launch the game. You start by picking one of four classes. The Psyker, your token magic character of this game, designed with area of effect and crowd control attacks that could be harmful to the user if used too quickly. This class is powerful in every right and hard to master. The Veteran Sharpshooter, a simple human. That's not to say they're underwhelming by any means. The sharpshooter is a crack shot and can either focus on pinpoint heavy damage or rapid fire crowd control. The Ogrim, a towering abhuman with stunted intelligence. This is your brute, a being of pure strength able to carry some serious firepower and eat las rounds for breakfast. The Zealot Preacher, a devout psychopath who excels in engaging the enemy head on in melee combat. These zealots live, breathe, and die in gore, all in the Emperor's name. Each one of these classes are unique and interesting, with an entirely different gameplay loop. You have a job to do, so you better get good at it for the sake of your team. Each character has a class ability, which could be anything from a massive damage boost to your ranged weapon, or a directional charge that knocks a pile of enemies on their ass. As you learn to play, your character will level up. You will get stronger, unlock new game-changing feats of power such as bottomless grenades or an unbreakable shield. And the best part is, if you don't like your class or just want to try another one, you can make a new one whenever you want and still retain your old character. Your class selection will have an optimal combat loop. The overall loop is shoot the bad guys when they're far away and chop them to bits when they're close. This is the most prominent feature in the game. No matter what class you choose, you will shoot often and you will melee often. The learning curve is when to do which and how to recognize if you're in over your head. Melee combat consists of a couple basic yet fluid components. Swing, block, dodge, shove, and sometimes parry. Although I, Taylor, uh, don't know if I ever successfully did this in my eight hours of game time, and I tried really, really hard. Seems simple until you're engaged by multiple opponents. Remember, Fat Shark began developing their melee combat with War of the Roses in 2012 and nearly perfected it in Vermintide 1 and 2. Their decades of experience with melee combat can really be felt in Dark Tide, like they finally perfected the perfect wine. But I don't know anything about wine, so take that with a grain of salt. The animations are smooth, the visceral damage is satisfying, and the tougher, armored enemies can be really engaging to fight while trying not to be swarmed. I want to mention the different types of melee weapons in Dark Tide. I, Taylor, only had a chance to play around with three, the combat axe, the sword, and the chainsword. The combat axe and chainsword were two really heavy hitting, high damage, but slow swing weapons that did well against big armored enemies. Whereas the sword was a great horde killer, being able to stun lock unarmored enemies until you hack them to death. Both choices were good, but I found that an Ogren player was often better at being the hard hitting big guy killer than me. So I would play with the sword with the focus of holding off swarms of lighter guys. I will say that along with every weapon's light swing and heavy swing, all weapons have alt attacks. The axe's alt attack just seemed to me like a slower light swing. The 
chain swords alt attack was revving up the chainsaw and sawing guys down but this was slow and only hit the person you were aiming at and the normal swords alt was a parry that i simply couldn't learn to time right in my short chaotic playtime it's not the most complex combat system, but it fits very well in a game where being overwhelmed and significantly outnumbered is a guarantee. Speaking of being outnumbered and overwhelmed, let's talk about toughness. Toughness is essentially an energy shield, like in Halo, except instead of just waiting a few seconds and having it regenerate, you have a few different ways to trigger regeneration. Everyone can regenerate it in two ways. One is by killing enemies in melee combat. The second is being within a certain distance or cohesion of your team. Combining those two things can make your character nearly invincible. If you play to your strengths. Sometimes you can even heal faster than you're damaged. With the game's feat system, similar to the one found in Vermintide, you can tweak the way your class plays. A melee focused zealot might find that healing more toughness when within a specific distance of an enemy is really helpful while a range-focused sharpshooter might find that being able to heal more toughness on kills is just more helpful to them. This all combines into a really cool mechanic, where every class has a lot of choices in how to build their character. On the surface, the gunplay may seem trivial, or even maybe a little boring, until you're in the action. I played the veteran sharpshooter during the beta and loved every second of it. Darktide isn't built for you to sit in a corner and play point-and-click all day. You need to be able to position yourself, know when danger is close, and have a backup plan. Not every enemy should be hit with a shovel. There's a correct tool for every job, right? The guns are fairly simple, with a heavy flare on their use. The last guns have a consistent fire rate, the very high capacity, while your auto guns are just the opposite. Low mag cap that hits hard. Shotguns have a low ammo count, but they pack a punch. Every gun has an alternate ability, or a bayonet function. The shotgun could load a single shell that unleashed a crazy amount of damage. The revolver could be used to pistol whip. And the last gun? Had a flashlight. Most of these brought some unique ways to take on the challenges of the game. Neither the gunplay or the melee combat outshine the other. Rather, they're entirely symbiotic in their carnage. With all that said about the combat, one unlikely prospect pulls it together. The music. If you know one thing about the 2016 release of Doom, I bet it's the music. Mick Gordon created something absolutely wonderful with that soundtrack in a way that's never really been done before. Combat affected soundscaping. What that means exactly is the music responds in regards to the player's actions. Rather than running off a script, it actually recognizes what's going on in the game. Jesper Kidd, Darktide's lead composer, followed in these footsteps. Instead of Doom Speed Metal or Industrial Gin, we are flooded with a unique taste of what I can only describe as Electronica Coral. One of my most memorable experiences in the game is taking on a boss while the music swelled, and I couldn't help but fire my last gun to the beat. It's just that good. Now, who exactly are we supposed to be blasting and slashing at Darktide? The simple answer is Agents of Chaos, Daemon Worshippers, specifically, Worshippers of the God of Disease, Decay, and Entropy, Nurgle. These pox walking, maggot infested cultists come in all different shapes, sizes, and specialties. You have some very familiar enemy types that are reminiscent of the games that come before it. You have your pouncers, your trappers, suicide bombers, and some others. Others, such as stage bosses. These guys can be pretty challenging. In the harder difficulty missions of the beta, we had the opportunity to meet an Ogryn who chose a life of mucus and bile. These fights were not particularly easy to handle, as you still had to deal with your standard hordes and specialties. The enemy variety felt familiar, yet fresh, 
With the special and elite enemies having a specific role in combat, it was important to pay attention and trust that your teammates knew their own roles. You'll discover that none of the classes can handle every fight on their own. You need to use your team's diversity to your advantage. Like I said, you have a job to do, and you better know what that is. Here is where we tell you our opinion. Shut the, the fuck way. up, Robert! It's been over 30 minutes! Why the fuck am I supposed to be worried about Dark Tide, you pandering son of a bitch? Everything we've talked about so far is of our own opinions and experiences. This isn't an advertisement. We're not being paid by Games Workshop. I just feel passionate about this game and what it could be, what it could mean. Everyone here at U Street had a great time with the beta. Hell, I put nearly 14 hours into it over the weekend, and when it closed, the only real problem I found myself facing was that I wanted more, on a few levels. Because of how invested I am in this project, I want to voice some of my concerns. After all, that's why I talked about Space Hulk in such depth. Remember that pro-con list we made? Well, Dark Tide is in danger of falling into a very similar situation. It truly is a beautiful, immersive experience with top-notch sound design. But that one word started to ring in my head again. Repetitive. It was a beta. A closed beta at that. I know. But it had a few major takeaways. I spoke earlier about how the world design is incredible, but I didn't mention the level design so much. Not to say that it's bad by any means. They're huge, detailed, filled with optional routes and decorated to the max. Enemies were always a threat and you rarely had a chance to breathe. When you finally did come to a moment of respite, it was earned. We had four total missions available to us, each with their own map. The objectives varied, however, only one mission really stood out. The assassination mission, with a geared up boss at the end of a long journey through sewers and hovels. The other three didn't just blend together because of the similar objectives, but the map designs felt blurred, much like the missions in Space Hulk. When we would load into a mission, well into the beta, one of the guys would always guess at what the mission was, or ask me outright. The only time they ever got it right was that assassination mission, solely because of its starting placement. Four missions is not a lot to go off of, and we really don't know how many missions and maps we're going to have on launch. I am, however, worried that the issues we experience may be prevalent in the full title. On the other hand, I loved every minute of Vermintide's mission and map designs. They felt distinct. You could easily tell them apart through the entire series. Honestly, who knows where we'll be going or what we'll be doing in the lifespan of Darktide. If the updates are anything like the addition of Beastmen to Vermintide, then I know it'll be great. I keep asking myself how I want to approach the topic of weapon and class inconsistencies. I think the majority of our concerns stem from the possibility that we only saw a fraction of the content that we should expect on launch day. But there are some glaring issues. Not all weapons are created equal. In the beta, you would either get weapons as a mission reward, or you could buy them from the store if possible. Your rewarded weapons could be anything available to your class, but they weren't always better than what you had. That's absolutely fine. It's supposed to be a grindy, live-service loot reward game like Destiny. The problem came from what weapons you had available. I am very partial to the LAS gun. It feels, sounds, and looks amazing. And it's a Warhammer staple. Yet, as I leveled up more and more, I saw the last gun slowly filter out of availability. I was limited to the auto rifle or a shotgun that would completely change how the game was played. After some time, my best last gun was severely underleveled compared to my other weapon choices, limiting my damage output in higher difficulty missions. Another reminiscent of Space Hulk. Locked in gameplay. However, rather than forcing me to use a single weapon over the course of the game, it now heavily manipulated me to change my playstyle up every few levels. The Steam charts show the concurrent player base of the beta peaked at just over 45,000 players. That's not a particularly small number for a closed beta. I mean, the intention was to test the servers and look for bugs. I think we did pretty well in that regard. Plenty of server lag, being forcibly locked out, game crashes. These were not only expected, but anticipated. I really do think the game will be completely playable on launch, especially given that the release date is two months away. One stressor that we did find was that the game was very graphically intensive. It took a while to figure out what settings were affecting my performance the most. Robert struggled to even get the game playable on the lowest settings. 
I was able to play at or around 60 FPS on medium settings with no flare, like volumetric fog, and even then OBS had a difficult time keeping up and recording for the standard I had set it. Optimization should definitely be a priority for the team over at Fat Shark. However, if you're confident in your rig, you won't have much to worry about. The conclusion to our Dark Tide concerns, that surprisingly has no comparison to Space Hulk, can be summed up in three words. Predatory business practices. It's no surprise, really. Nearly every title over the last decade has some form of premium currency or content locked behind a paywall. These companies are desperate to increase their bottom line by selling you horse armor for $2.50? Fucking cut! I fucking quit! Mail me my goddamn check! Alright, alright. I've learned my lesson. No more VO for Taylor. As annoying and egregious as it is, it makes sense. Shareholders expect constant growth. Publishers just can't rely on game sales anymore. There is, however, a classy way to get your players to pay more, such as selling cosmetic items, and a Scrooge-like way, such as locking content behind paywalls or pay-to-progress games. I have my reservations about Fat Shark's plans. While I love the idea of every cosmetic being available without purchase, we don't really know how difficult it's going to be to attain these items. On that same note, we can't even have full confidence that the weapons won't eventually be locked behind a paywall. If that happens, are these weapons going to be unique? Or are they going to be reskins with better stats? I guess we're just gonna have to wait and see. We also know that the developers are creating Darktide as a live service experience with an evolving story. I have some pretty deeply rooted annoyances with developers and their live services. Life happens. People get busy or distracted. Not everyone can set aside their lives and play a game they purchased when it's convenient for the developers or the publishers. I paid full price for Destiny 2 at launch. I bought the game that was advertised. When it went free to play, the content I had once owned no longer existed. Blizzard is currently under scrutinization for a similar reason. I bought Overwatch at launch, and now that Overwatch 2 has come out, they shut down Overwatch 1 completely. Again, I can no longer play the specific content that I had purchased. The worst part of that is, Overwatch 2 is a broken mess, and I can't change that. I just have to live with it. I have high hopes for Fast Shark. Given that they treated Vermintide fans very well with free DLCs and a you bought it, you own it attitude. But how sure can we be that Darktide won't end up like Destiny 2 or Overwatch 2? Darktide is a ton of fun. The concerns we did have never overshadowed the enjoyable gameplay or immersive world. As soon as the beta ended, I felt an unquenchable thirst to play more. A week later, and I still miss it. I try not to get my hopes up for games on launch day anymore, but I just can't help it with Darktide. Then I think to myself, what if we get another overambitious Warhammer title like Space Hulk? What if it follows the same practices as Destiny 2? I guess I'll just have to do my best to stay cautiously optimistic. And you should too. Roll the credits! God damn! I just wanted to make a quick shout out to Fat Shark in general for letting us take part in this beta. I know we ended on a bit of a negative there, but we really did have an awesome time with it. Um, I also want to say thanks to Mr. Dingus, he's in the description. He lended me a ton of footage. Uh, like I said in the video, a lot of my OBS uh, recordings had issues. So thank you so much, Reese. And um, finally, I just want to say thank you to you guys who made it this far into the video. Um, this has been a passion of ours for well over a decade, and we're just so excited to finally produce content like this. Um, we're also very interested in what you guys have to say. So if I got anything wrong, or you just outright disagree with any of the thoughts in the video, let us know. We'll only ever get better with your criticisms. Seriously, thank you. See you next time.